It was the night after a full moon when three people lost their lives in a little flat in the northeast of England in the 1930s in what was either a moment of madness or calculated deception. and welcome to my very first caffeine crime and chills video I mentioned in my last video that I was going to be uploading some slightly different content and one of the areas I'm really interested in is um, true crime and um, the supernatural and this case that I'm going to talk about today combines the two of them because not only have I got a very interesting true crime story for you I also have some um, very interesting tidbits about the actual house and um, I've spoken to someone who lived there and I have some paranormal stories to tell you about um, someone who lived in the um, House of Horrors. Well, this isn't a case that I've ever seen covered on the internet ever um, and I have never heard any true crime podcast mention it so I'm hoping I'm bringing you something interesting here that you've never heard if you're into true crime. And so this is my new series, Caffeine, Crime and Chills. I've got my cup of coffee here ready to drink as, um, as we go along. And so grab a tea, grab a coffee, grab a wine, whatever it is that you need and um, let's get into the House of Horrors. Before we get into this story I'm going to give a quick content warning. Um, this story does feature some child murder so if that's something that you're not interested in and that's something that you can't listen to then I'll totally understand and um, I hope I see you in my next one but for anybody else who wants to stick around let's get crazy. So William or Billy Parker was a Newcastle man who was born around 1911 into a typical working class background. Life in Newcastle at that time was pretty harsh compared to today's standards. However saying that life was starting to improve bit by bit as the UK crawled its way out of the Victorian era and into a slightly more fun period of time. Life in the UK at that time was some of the most urbanised in the world where there were more people living in the cities than there were in any of the countryside in the UK. Electricity was also on the rise and there were also starting to be cars appearing in the streets. Along with this new fun era, new activities were popping up for people to enjoy. It was still very much manual labour in the region with people working very hard and very long hours but now there were starting to be more and more leisure activities for people to enjoy in their spare time. New and exciting opportunities for people in the region were starting to pop up such as a flying competition that was held in Gosforth Park. Obviously things went quickly south again with the outbreak of World War I in a couple of years but for the time being people were starting to really learn to enjoy life as well as working hard. Now William's early life seemed pretty standard there's not a lot of information about him at this time and um, that probably means that he flew under the radar for the majority of it and the only real information that you can get on him prior to the events of 1938 is the information on his employment history and um, it shows that he worked as a miner in one of the region's coal mines at the time Coal was the region's main industry at the time and therefore coal mining was a pretty standard job for a man or a boy to hold at that time. But coal mining was dangerous and backbreaking work um, where conditions left a lot to be desired. At some points children as young as five were sent to work down the mine in appalling conditions which often led to fatalities. Um, there were things such as the mines would blow up, there would be mine collapses or just the inhalation of the toxic coal fumes and um, yeah fatalities were commonplace among that industry. But William was seemingly unable to hold down a steady job at the time. This was probably due in part to his hedonistic side where he seemed to enjoy gambling and drinking away the family funds more than he enjoyed actually turning up for work. However this didn't stop him from finding a wife and on Boxing Day in 1936 William married Jane making her Jane Parker and he and his wife moved to a little flat in Edwins Avenue in Newcastle. The flat that they moved into was an upstairs three bedroom flat and the area that they moved into is commonly known by the locals as the city. Now William and Jane did not waste any time in starting a family and just two years later William and Jane were the parents of two children, one year old Shirley and two month old Cecil. However life as William's wife was not an easy one. Friends of Jane later recounted that they couldn't understand Jane being married to such a lazy scoundrel as William. William at this point was bringing in money by golf caddying and occasionally going and finding lost golf balls and selling them for money at nearby golf courses in Gosworth Park in Benton. This new life of being stuck at home waiting on a man who seemed very unreliable was new and pretty hard to swallow for Jane who had previously worked as a parlour maid in both Kent and Newcastle upon Tyne. Friends and family described her as a hard worker. They also described her as a good mother and um, she was known to try and put everything that she could into the children and to try and make their lives as good as she could. She was never known to be short-tempered or irritable around her children. She always put on this brave mother in face with them, even though at times there was no food on the table and no money coming in when William was out gambling. 
One neighbour who later gave a character reference for Jane described how even though the Parker family were living in relative poverty, Jane Parker would still share her coals with the neighbour to ensure that the neighbour had some heat and I think that sort of is quite telling as to the character of this woman who was willing to give the very little that she had to make sure that someone else had some comfort. So the story begins when William Parker walked into a police station in Forest Hall and handed himself into the police on the 25th of April 1938. He claimed that he had murdered his wife in self-defence three days earlier. William briefly described the events that had taken place that fateful Friday night. He claimed that he returned home as usual late on in the evening to find a scene of absolute horror waiting for him. According to William's version of events, Jane had lost all sense and reason and had strangled and killed both of the children. And then when William stumbled upon this, what would have been a horrific scene, Jane then turned her attentions to William and came at him with a poker. As he finished telling his story, William began to sway and then collapsed in what was to become sort of his trademark move over the forthcoming story. The police in the station were obviously shocked by what they'd heard, but laid William Parker flat so that he could recover his senses whilst they searched his body. And in one of his pockets, they found a letter which was addressed to Jane Parker and it therefore gave them a home address. And obviously at that time, police were immediately dispatched to the flat. When they got there, the flat was in darkness and it was all closed down. And so the police forced entry and ran up the stairs into the upstairs flat to see what they could find. Upon arrival, what they noticed was children's toys scattered everywhere, but nothing that seemed out of the ordinary. And so at this point, the two investigating officers decided that they would split up and each go to a different side of the house. The way that these flats are set up is that you would go up the stairs and there were bedrooms on one side and then you would go across the hall to the other side and there was a bedroom on the other side there too. So the police went in two separate directions to see what they could find in these bedrooms. In the back bedroom, there was a single bed that was pushed against a window and on that single bed were a pile of clothes. The officer who had entered this particular room knew what was likely underneath these clothes and so he reluctantly reached out and peeled back the layers to reveal the absolute horror that was underneath. The body of a woman beaten so badly that she was unrecognisable was lying on the bed. Her hair was matted with blood and she also had the tines of a string around her neck so deep that it was cutting into her flesh. The officer could tell from the state of the body that the body had been lying there for a couple of days. The officer was surveying the scene of absolute horror when he was snapped back to reality by a shout from the bedroom on the other side of the house, which would have been the front bedroom. And knowing full well and dreading what was coming, the officer then hurried across the hallway to go and join his colleague in the, in the front bedroom. This little bedroom, which would have once been the bedroom for the children, was now a scene of unimaginable savagery. Both the children, both one-year-old Shirley and two-month-old Cecil were lying side by side underneath a little blanket in a cot and both of them showed the signs of strangulation. They also had strings tied around their neck just like their mum. It was also apparent that the babies had been lying there side by side in a cot for a couple of days. Upon their return to the station, the officers discovered that Parker had now recovered his senses enough to be up and talking and they informed him that they had been to his house and they had had a look around and they confirmed that they had discovered the bodies of his wife and children in the, be in the, in the various bedrooms. And then they asked Parker to explain what had taken place between the murders and the three days following because it was now Monday night and they wanted to know what had happened with Parker's lost three days. And the story that Parker told was, quite frankly, bizarre. Parker started a story on the Friday evening when he said that everything had been going well and around nine o'clock he had decided to nip out to buy some cigarettes from the local tobacconist. As he went out, his wife Jane was sitting at the kitchen table nursing their eldest child, Shirley, whilst the youngest baby, Cecil, was asleep in his cot. He said he had been gone around 15 minutes and walked back into the flat to find a scene that he just couldn't quite believe. According to Parker, Jane had her hands around Cecil's neck and had him bent over backwards in the cot and was strangling the life out of him as William looked on in horror. Then, according to Parker, Jane dropped the lifeless body of two-month-old Cecil backwards into the cot grabbed a poker and advanced towards Parker with murderous intent. Parker, fearing for his life, turned to flee but missed the door handle and failed and was advanced upon by Jane, who began to rain blows on him with the, with the poker. Parker looked sick to his stomach as he described the moment that Jane began to rain down the blows on him. 
and he said that he was able to deflect the first blow but after that she managed to get a few in. And this is the point where William claims that he reached out and grabbed anything that he could get hold of nearby and the instrument that his hands landed on just happened to be a hammer. And he claims that in this moment of pure desperation for his life, he's just seen his wife kill his son and um, she's now trying to kill him too. So in this moment of frenzy and fear for his life, he begins to return blows with the hammer to Jane. Parker went on to explain that Jane was in such a murderous rampage that even a full force hit in the head with a hammer didn't slow her down. It took several hits with the hammer and she was still going at him. Unfortunately around this time that Parker claims that Jane was intent on delivering a fatal blow to William Parker's head, he says that he lost all sense of reason and couldn't quite remember the events that followed. But the events that followed had him coming round to find Jane not moving, motionless, on the sofa. William Parker claimed that his next move was to pick up the lifeless body of his wife and carry her through to that bedroom and lay her down on the bed and cover her body with clothes. He then claims that he went back into the kitchen area where the assault had taken place and just clean up, which is which is what he did. He cleaned up, he cleaned up the blood, he sorted himself out, he washed himself down and then after thoroughly exhausting himself he decided to sleep. He went to bed for the night of course he couldn't sleep in the bedrooms, so now he lay and went to sleep in the front room with the bodies of his wife and children in the various bedrooms around him. The next day Parker wakes up and is dismayed to find that his family are all still dead and so he decides that what he's going to do is not hand himself into the police because although he claims he wanted to, he says that his will prevented him from doing so. And so with nothing else better to do, he took himself off for a day's golf caddying. He spent the entire day on the golf course caddying around and then he decided to wander aimlessly around Forest Hall area. He didn't want to go home because obviously the bodies of his family were all in the house and so he just wandered aimlessly until he found himself at the cinema. And so with nothing else better to do, he took himself in and um, took in a film. After he enjoyed his movie with his family lying dead just streets away, Parker decided to carry on his aimless wandering and ended up at a travelling fair which was again just around the corner and down the street from the bodies of his wife and children. And there he entertained himself a bit wandering amongst the stalls. He was actually spotted there by a neighbour, um, so we do know that he actually did actually go to that fair. Um, and he just wandered around there for the evening before exhausting himself again. By this point he really didn't fancy going home and facing all the death and so he decided to take himself to his mum's house where he was always welcome and he slept in the spare room. The next day was Sunday. Now Sunday was normally traditionally a family day, a day, a day that most people at the time would have gone to church and spent the day as a family but William couldn't spend it with his family because they were all lying dead and so he thought there was nothing else better for it than to go and pot take in some more golf caddying. After that, you've guessed it, he decided that he might go back to that cinema again and just see another film, why not? And then after enjoying another visual experience, he took himself out and decided to go take himself back to his mum's house for another sleep. And that completed William Parker's last weekend of freedom ever again. William woke up on April the 25th, which was now a Monday, and he felt the bodies of his family weighing heavily on his conscience and he decided that today would possibly be the day that he would go to the police and hand himself in. But first he decided that he would take in a bit of fresh air just to clear his mind and get himself ready for what was to come. And so he went out of his mum's house which was also in Forest Hall and um, just began to wander. And before long he found that he had wandered three and a half miles and was now on Gosforth High Street. Whilst he was wandering down Gosforth High Street, William just happened to notice a bike pushed up against the shop. And feeling like he might just have a little moment of madness, William decided on impulse to steal the bike and so he did. He sat on the bike and began to pedal. <laughs> and wow did he pedal. He cycled inexplicably a 119 mile round trip. He went to Berwick upon Tweed and back again for no apparent reason, just on a bike. Um, yeah, 119 miles. He just, just fancied a little bit of exercise before he handed himself into the police. By this time it was getting late and he arrived back in Forest Hall around 10 o'clock, half 10 at night and pedalled himself off to the police station, walked in and that brings us back to the moment in time. Taking himself off right up to the top end of England, right on the border of Scotland was enough to make him 
have time and clarity to think about what you might want to say to the police and we all know how that went. As we know, Parker told the police on duty there that he had murdered his wife after she had gone on a murderous rampage, killing his children and trying to kill him too. And he was filled with sadness and self-pity until the police told him that he would be getting tried with murder. And then Parker became incensed and started shouting that he didn't kill her maliciously. He couldn't quite understand why he would be tried for murder when everything was Jane's fault. And I think it's pretty fair to say that the police were feeling pretty skeptical of William Parker's story at this time. Mr. Parker's confession traveled fast and it wasn't long before people around the area had heard exactly what had happened and had heard William Parker's version of events. However, it turns out that Jane Parker was very well liked in the local community, but the same can't be said for William Parker, who had a bit of a shady record and seemed to have earned the contempt of most people who had met him. Neighbours and friends spoke of William's work shy attitude and his lack of care for his young family who waited patiently hoping for his meagre wages to be brought home but the majority of the time he didn't bring them home. He was often seen playing pitch and toss with every penny that he had and as usually happens with people who are gambling they tend to lose their money and um, that's exactly what happened with William a lot of the time and the family went hungry time after time after time. William Parker's boss even stepped in to say that there were several occasions where William just hadn't even bothered showing up for work. So some of the days he had gone out to work but he didn't even go, he just went and spent the day gambling and drinking and um, leaving his poor family to fend for themselves. Jane and the children were consistently time and time again described by neighbours and friends as malnourished and witnesses had seen Jane forego and eating food herself if there was any left at all because she would try and make sure that her children had something to eat and something on their stomach, especially the older one because Cecil was still a baby in arms so I'm assuming he was still probably being breastfed given the time period but if Jane wasn't getting any calories she wouldn't have been able to produce the milk to feed Cecil and therefore Cecil would suffer that way too. Jane was only in her early 20s, from what I've seen she was 25 years old and um, she was described as already looking a lot older than her young years. And this was probably due to the stress of trying to keep her family alive under such horrible conditions and um, not only did she have to try and scrape together enough money to feed her family and look after them but she also had to find enough money to pay off some money lenders who were at her door quite a bit for money that they owed. These debts would just keep her on the mountain which would have only added to Jane's stress. These testimonies were further backed up by Dr. Henry Cookson, who conducted the post-mortem on Jane and the children. He described Jane as a very frail woman and said that it wouldn't have taken much to kill her, which doesn't really go hand in hand with the story that Parker handed out, that Jane just kept coming at him no matter how many times he hit her with that hammer. He also discussed the appalling damage to Jane's skull and said that she had several fractures and at times the hammer had gone through to the bone um, and said that she most likely would have been unconscious at the time of a strangulation, which is, I suppose, a small mercy that she wasn't awake to realise she was being strangled. Probably the last thing Jane ever knew was arguing with her husband in the kitchen. So not quite the frenzied killer that needed stopped in her tracks immediately. The defence could have possibly still argued temporary insanity on Jane's part as she attempted to slay her entire family had it not been for the lack of evidence on William Parker himself. See, after a story of Jane coming at him time and time again on the poker, William Parker was examined by a police doctor to see what marks and injuries had been inflicted upon him in order for him to have had to use deadly force to stop his wife. However, Upon examination of William, two small marks were found on him and an unrelated scratch on his finger, which don't quite correlate with his version of events. More and more damning statements just kept coming and coming and coming, and one in particular was from a neighbour who lived next door to the Parker family and due to the way that the houses were built, she could hear everything through the walls. And she said that Jane was always a kind and considerate and caring mother. She told of Jane's struggles of trying to look after and nurture a young family with the poverty that was inflicted upon them by her husband. And she said that although Jane was kind and caring and really considerate of her children, um, she could often hear Jane and William arguing through the wall about money. The very same neighbour happened to hear goings on in the flat the night of the murder, but she told a story that didn't quite correlate with William's version of events either. 
She said that around 7 p.m. a fight had broken out and she heard the argument escalate pretty quickly through the wall. Now this was a whole two hours before William had claimed that he went out at 9 p.m. where everything had been fine up until that point. This is two hours earlier and there is a pretty vicious fight happening in that house. One part of Parker's story was true however, he did nip out around 9 p.m. to a tobacconist. However, the experience wasn't the carefree, happy family man just out to buy some cigarettes. The shop girl who served him remembered her interaction with Parker that night and remembered him as being nervous, cagey, acting a bit suspicious and in a bit of a hurry. Now, to the skeptic that might look like William killed his family at around 7pm, took about two hours to clean up and then went out. As it happens, Parker had made another fateful mistake the very next night whilst he was wandering around that travelling fair. Remember the travelling fair where he was spotted by a neighbour? It just so happened to be the very same neighbour who had heard the argument in the flat the night previous and was a little bit mystified as to why Jane hadn't resurfaced from the flat the next day because this was in the time where everybody had their doors open and people would be in and out talking to their neighbours and um, it was unusual for Jane not to have resurfaced from the flat. And as it happens, the neighbour had actually called on Jane several times throughout the day and had gotten no answer and just found the whole thing suspicious. So she very bravely confronted William Parker at this fairground and asked him point blank where his wife was, to which William replied that she was sick and had gone to stay with her mum and would be there for a week or so. This was a huge red flag to the neighbour who had looked after Jane when she had been ill several times before and Jane did the same for her. It was highly unusual for Jane just to abscond without telling the neighbour where she was going and to have just suddenly developed a mysterious illness. All in all, after all this information came to light, it took the jury just one and a quarter hours to convict Parker of the murder of his wife. However, sadly, he was never tried for the murder of his children. He was originally arrested on the charge of the murder of his wife and children, but for some reason, somewhere along the line, when he went to court, he was never tried for the murders of his children, and so the murders of his children have never really fully been addressed. However, he was convicted for the murder of his wife, and even though it hasn't been officially put down that he murdered his children, it has been commonly accepted that he did do so. General consensus is also that his aimless wandering around, taking in films, going on mammoth cycling, was all a way to concoct some story that would keep him out of the gallows when he eventually did go to the police and try and explain what had happened. William shouted out that he was not guilty as his guilty plea was read. The court had to pause whilst William swayed again and fainted in the courtroom adding to the overall dramatic spectacle that was William Parker. He was swiftly brought round with the aid of smell and salts and um, was brought round just in time to hear that he had been in fact sentenced to death. So when he learned that his fate was to be death by hanging, he again fainted. The verdict had been so quick that William Parker's family missed the reading and missed the judgement because they were all out to lunch and didn't think that the, that the jury would come back quite so quickly. So there was a bit, of a, a bit of a kerfuffle there when they found out that they'd missed hearing their son be condemned to death. So it was on the 26th of July 1938 that William Parker began his very last day on earth. He refused his breakfast and instead sipped on a cup of tea while he waited for the executioner to arrive. His executioner was to be Albert Pierpoint, who was Britain's leading executioner at the time, and in his 25 years as an executioner, he ended the lives of between 435 and 600 people. This time there were no dramatics, no words were spoken, and he went quietly to his fate. So at 8am on that morning, William Parker ended his life by hanging. So what do you think? Do you think Parker ended everybody's life in a rage one night in an argument? Or do you think that his version of events might hold some truth to them? And perhaps Jane did end the lives of her babies to maybe end their suffering. I know what I think happened, but I'd be very interested to hear what you thought. But then we move on to the question of, is it haunted? And it just so happens that I know someone who lived in that house in the 1970s and they lived there for 10 years and they had a lot to tell me about some of the weird goings on that went on in that house. She eventually reached the point where she wouldn't enter the house by herself. I'm gonna call her Ellie because I don't wanna give away her true identity. Um, and so yeah, I'm just gonna tell you basically what happened with her. So Ellie moved into this house and she had no idea that this was um, the murder house. 
she had heard talk in the area of the murder house, but it was only after she moved in that she found out that her house was the murder house. And so she did some fact checking, some digging, and found out from several different sources that her house was indeed the house of the murders. And the reason that she started checking out whether her house was the house of murders, because things had started to happen in the house. So she had a dog and her dog was terrified. Her dog would go into different rooms and come running out with its tail between its legs whimpering. Um, the dog was just petrified of certain areas of the house which just happened to be the bedrooms. And so over the years she told me there were things such as um, the lights would turn on in the bedrooms by themselves. And so they, her and her husband used to play this game where they would turn out all of the lights and run to the other side of the house and then go back and a lot of times they would go back by the time they'd reached one side of the house and gone back to the other the lights would be back on again um, they never heard them turning on and they never saw them turning on but they would always leave the room and when they came back the lights were on um, that was one of the things that started to make them think that something was a bit suspicious and that's what made them start looking into whether their house was indeed the murder house and um, it was. So there were other weird occurrences over the years that used to repeat themselves. So there was a situation where they would put light bulbs in and the light bulbs were screwing, um, but the light bulbs would really bizarrely unscrew themselves and fall onto the floor. But the ceilings in these flats were pretty high and somehow when the light bulb, which is glass, would fall from the ceiling to the floor, it never smashed. It would always just fall down. They were the type of light bulbs that you would put, put in, screw in and click into place. So the light bulb would be clicked into place but then it would unclick itself and fall to the floor and not break. There was another occasion, they had some friends over for some tea and just general chats and you know, hanging out with your friends. And they had these cups on saucers and they presented their friends with cups of tea. Then according to Ellie, all of the teacups just split in half. These cups had been fine beforehand, these cups were made for cups of tea and um, the cups all just split in half and just broke. And the kettle would turn itself on, which I'm familiar with because that used to happen in my old house. The kettle would switch itself on and um, there would be noises in the night. One particular night Ellie tells me that she woke up and she saw a figure stand at the foot of her bed which started to advance towards her and she couldn't wake her husband up. She was trying to get him to wake up and he wouldn't wake up and she was shaking him and shaking him and eventually he woke up and the figure disappeared but she was absolutely petrified and I think that was around the time that she started refusing to enter the house by herself. Um, and one of the other events that she told me about was that she was in her bed at night in one of the, the bedrooms, in one of the bedrooms um, that she didn't know what occurred in the bedroom. She didn't know where the murders had taken place, but she was in the bedroom. Again, her husband was sound asleep and the dog used to sleep in their bedroom with them underneath the dressing table. She heard her name being called and it woke her up out of her sleep of someone calling her name. And as she woke up, she said the voice changed to sort of a whispered shout. And from the corner of the room where the dog was underneath the bed, all she could hear was Ellie and she tried to wake her husband up but he wouldn't wake up again and eventually when she managed to wake him that's when the voices stopped and so they moved out of that house when they eventually could get round to it and I happen to know that there have been a lot of people have come and gone in that house over the next few years um you can only wonder why can't you you can only wonder if maybe everyone's experiencing something a little bit unusual in there so I thought that was a nice way to finish that off because often I wonder about whether houses that have seen horrible atrocities such as this end up with a sort of a fingerprint, if you will, sort of a, a smudging on the, on the energy of the house. And um, I think in this case it probably most definitely has because it sounded like a particularly nasty situation. So there we go, we've reached the end and it was a mammoth one, it was a long one, but I hope you stuck around to the end and I hope you've enjoyed this one. I think William Parker did it. Do you think perhaps the house is haunted after everything that happened there? And um, I'll speak to you all soon. Bye for now.